One of the things that I came to appreciate when I became a student of Martin Luther was the work of Lucas Cranach, who was a contemporary of Luther's and a friend, a neighbor, a prominent citizen in Wittenberg, and who founded a, an artist's workshop, essentially, which produced an enormous amount of art during his lifespan and that of his son, Lucas Cranach the Younger. There was a whole family business, but the two people who, whose names are associated with it are the two Lucas Cranachs. They lived uh, on a span of almost the entire 16th century, plus Lucas Cranach the Elder was actually born in the 15th century. He was 11 years older than Luther and lived longer than Luther. So he spanned his lifetime, spanned that of Martin Luther. They were friends on top of everything else. It was a small town after all. And Cranach was an, uh, a confidant of the, the local ruler, the elector of Saxony, because he was also the court painter. But I'll say some more about that as we go along. I have this slide has a, this uh, lecture has a lot of slides, but there there's no there are no words on any of the slides. It's all just pictures. This is Lucas Cranach the Elder, at the age of seventy four. He lived a, a long life for people in the sixteenth century and was an extremely hale person, you can see even at that point. This painting is by his son, Lucas Cranach the Younger. Unfortunately, we don't have a good portrait of the second Cranach. Um, he didn't do self-portraits and doesn't seem to have commissioned one of himself in his busyness. But, uh, but he, took, he did more than one picture of his father. Uh, on the right-hand side is the gravestone of Lucas Cranach the Elder, which is outside the Church of St. James, in Weimar. Although uh, Cranach lived most of his active life in Wittenberg, he didn't come from there. He came from Franconia near Coburg in the, from the town of Kronach, which is why his name became Cranach, because it's a, a variation on the place where he was born. We actually don't know the family name of Lucas Cranach's ancestors. There's a theory that it's Muller, because that was one of the more common names, and at least one of his ancestors was a Miller. But his father, who was also an artist, was just known as Hans Mahler, Hans the painter. And when Cranach, the young Cranach, who seems to have shown artistic talent from an early age, uh, went to study in the workshops of other artists, he became known as Lucas from Cranach, or Lucas Cranach. And, uh, but then it becomes a family name. And from that point onward, his descendants have borne that name with pride. Um, in those days, to study art was a little bit like studying any kind of a craft. You were, would be apprenticed to someone, or you'd travel around to the workshops of masters and learn from them. Usually in exchange for room and board, you'd have an opportunity to learn from the master, and you would probably do the chores and do some uh, low-level work as well, even artistic work. When, uh, when Cranach himself was, was wealthy and important and had a whole workshop, he had a dozen apprentices all of whom were learning uh, art in his, the way he could teach it to them. And they were doing the boring parts of the painting that he didn't want to do. He really, and I'll say more about this in a bit, he had a, he had a painting factory in the sense that he would take the commissions, he would paint the important parts, which of course is the faces of the portraits and things like that, and then hand over to an apprentice the whole rest of the painting. And so most of the paintings that have the name of Cranach on them are collaborations, sometimes of a number of people whose names we don't know. So very frequently, uh, Cranach paintings are simply described as workshop of Lucas Cranach, because we can tell from the unmistakable style that's where they come from, but we don't necessarily know how much of it he actually had to do. Into Wittenberg today, any of you who've been to Wittenberg will know that on the market square, there are a couple of houses that are named for Cranach because in the course of his life, he became quite wealthy and he bought real estate as an investment. On the picture on the left, it is the orange colored house that is the Cranach house, it's a double house. And of course the facade is 19th century in style. But once you get back into the courtyard behind it, you can see 16th century buildings. He also about three doors further down to the right had the house on the corner of the market square, which is where he ran his pharmacy. He was also a pharmacist. Um, it's not as much of a stretch as you might think because the techniques that artists employed to make their own paints, which involved grinding things, minerals and herbs and other things in, and suspending them in oil in order to make paint, 
were very similar to the techniques used to make different kinds of medications. So, and Kronoff never missed an opportunity to make money on things. So he, uh, his, his uh, pharmacy, which still exists in Wittenberg, it's the Kronoff Apotheke. And if you go in there, you can get cough drops of the Kronoff recipe and, and also medicinal bitters. So concoctions made with bitter herbs that will help your digestion, or at least make you forget that you don't feel good. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and as I say, also real estate. He also was active in, uh, in city government. He served as the mayor of Wittenberg for a while. Uh, he was, as I said, a friend of Luther's. He is probably the one who threw and paid for the wedding party when Luther married Katharina von Bora. Uh, we know that he was at the wedding. He might even have been in the position of being Luther's best man. Um, and, uh, his, his son, Lucas Granath the Younger, married the town's most prominent attorney, who was also the Luther family's attorney. So there's a lot of kind of interconnection between these folks. And as I said, since he was the court painter, he would spend part uh, of his time in the castle with the ruler when the prince was there. He wasn't there all the time. And that's uh, from whom he got most of the, the most uh, profitable commissions was from the ruler who had the money for art. The picture on the right is the back of the Kronoff house, the courtyard behind, and you can see the whole courtyard was lined with buildings. On the right were stables and where they kept uh, lot, some, they have chickens and ducks and that kind of thing for to sustain the household. And above it are tiny little rooms in which the apprentices could live. And then in the, in the far back, the pink building at the back of the courtyard was where the printing shop was because he was also a printer and publisher and did all the, he made woodcuts, of course, which you could use to print um, many, many copies of the, of the things that he would paint. Obviously, they couldn't reproduce a painting cheaply, but they could make uh, 500 copies of something just from a woodblock easily enough. So he invested in all the technology needed for the time in order to have, in a sense, a media conglomerate, everything except for audio. They didn't do music, but they did every other kind of visual communication that was possible. And because Luther was an intense communicator, there was always something to say to the world that other people would want to know and would be willing to buy. So the, his importance is really great. Um, we begin to see paintings from Cranach from about 1504. He must have painted a long time before that. By that point, he was already in his late 20s. But we don't have any attribution, so we don't know uh, where they came from. But in 1504, we, he appears in the records of Wittenberg for the first time as uh, a salaried painter to the elector, to the Duke of Saxony. This was a, a position by which he was retained through a salary. It wasn't expected that he could live entirely on it, but, uh, but he kind of had the first right of refusal for anything that the elector wanted to have painted. And by this, not only paintings of the kind you think of, portraits and such, but also any painting that the, that the elector needed. If he wanted his coat of arms painted on a banner or on the side of a carriage or something like that, he really painted anything that needed to be painted. And, uh, and this was made him secure. It uh, made him decide to settle in Wittenberg. He bought, bought a house and became uh, a citizen there. And for his entire career, his primary client was the elector of Saxony. Who, was, um, who liked paintings, it was not a, probably a very astute art connoisseur, but who liked pictures of the things he liked pictures of and commissioned a lot of them from Lucas Crano. The, um, of course, in that period, at the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the Reformation, all the art that wasn't being made for rich people's entertainment, rich people's amusement and enjoyment, was, was tended to be religious art. And so the other area from which Karnach got a lot of commissions was from church, especially from church officials, bishops and abbots and such who wanted to decorate their churches with altarpieces. And these three paintings, which I really, I, sh I show all three of them simply to show how his style was in some ways consistent and in some ways evolved. These three paintings were made within a span of three or four years. Um, I know them by where they are now, the one on the, on the left is in the Westphalian Museum in Münster. The one uh, in the center is uh, 
in a museum in Innsbruck in Austria, and the one on the right is in the uh, Museum of the Visual Arts in uh, Leipzig in the eastern part of Germany. They're all three of the same subject. As you can see, they show God the Father wearing a, a crown very much like that of the Pope and an elaborate cope, uh, holding in his arms the, uh, the dead crucified Jesus, who in some proximity, either on his shoulder or in his lap or on his thigh, is also bearing the dove of the Holy Spirit. So it represents the Trinity visualized in one image. So these paintings are sometimes called Trinity paintings, but the common German name for them back in Kranoff's time was Gnadenstuhl, the seat or throne of grace, because it's from the energy generated by the Trinity that salvation comes. And they're surrounded by a circle of cherubs in, in the clouds. So angels in cloud-like formation around you just see their heads and little wings and some larger angels who bear in their hands various objects that represent the story of the suffering of Jesus, the passion of Christ. You see on the, this one on the, on the left, the angel on the left is holding a column, which is the column to which Jesus was bound when he was beaten by, by the, uh, the high priest's servants. And on the other side, there's a, a cross. It's a T-shaped cross, a tau cross, not one with the normal crossbar. You can see each time that Kranoff painted this, he painted it for a different patron and with, other, with different things in mind. This one on the, on the left has a simple landscape in the background of somewhere that we don't know, but it looks like Southern Germany. The one in the middle has added in two saints, probably at the request of the person who commissioned it, St. Bartholomew on the left, St. Sebastian on the right. You know Sebastian from art is usually a, a, a nearly nude figure with arrows sticking out of him. Well, in this case, Sebastian is a well-dressed young man with a handful of arrows denoting that, uh, that uh, martyrdom. And on the far right, this one is the best preserved and the most dramatic. I think chronologically, it was likely the last of the three to be painted. Shows in addition to Mary and, uh, and Sebastian, again, um, two figures at the bottom who represent the resurrection of the dead. The, that the, the, the throne of grace brings life to, to humankind. It's a complicated image in this case because they're, they're two very different people. The upper figure is a man with a, an ugly face and a grimaced expression, and he's wearing yellow, which in medieval art is always a sign something bad is going to happen. And, um, and the other one is a young woman who's very attractive and beautiful and also richly dressed, who has a, a very peaceful expression. So my thinking on this and, and that that most people who look at this painting uh, agree is that they represent the saved and the damned, that this man is rising to discover that his destiny is bad and that she is waking up to the glorious uh, view of heaven. He is not going to, he's going to be denied it. She's going to be given it. But it is a little bit unclear what that is all supposed to mean. But you can see that it wasn't important for Cranach to be original with every painting. In fact, people would see a painting of his in a church, and if they were themselves a rich person who wanted to commission a painting, they would say, I want one like that. And, uh, and that's what he would produce. And his workshop was incredibly prolific, in part because he relied on some standard formulas that, that, that pleased a lot of people. The, uh, the purpose of this kind of art is, is devotional. It's not so sure, I'm not so sure about this one on the left, but the other two were either intended for, for, for private devotion, that they would have been hung in a person's house and they would say their prayers in front of it, or be displayed in a church, either above an altar or above a, what, uh, a monument to a dead person. So kind of a memorial. Sometimes those had a, a framed painting in the middle of them. So we don't know exactly how these were used. They're all in museums now. They're not in their original locations. But the purpose of it is to draw the heart of the viewer into the story and to make them feel connected, in this case, to the story of salvation. That this has happened, Jesus has suffered, God the Father has taken Jesus to his breast, the Holy Spirit is mediating between them and us, and this is all a sign of God's favor to humankind and the potential for salvation that Jesus has brought to the world. So they're intended to deepen one's faith by reflection on things that 
aren't real in the sense that nobody ever saw Jesus like this. This is an imaginary depiction of what the Trinity could look like. No one has ever seen God in that way. So to even to depict God the Father as this bearded man is, a, is to construct a kind of symbolic fantasy. But everybody knows what it means. Everybody knows who it's supposed to be because they understand the rules that when this is depicted and this person with the flowing beard and the big crown is going to be God. Um, but it's, it takes you out of the real and into the, into the world of the symbolic and the metaphorical. And, but this is a language that both the viewer and the artist knew and they could share. This shifts, however, in the Reformation. And there is a, quite a lot of research and writing on the topic of how the Reformation changes art from this kind of abstract and getting out of oneself and into a, into a world of, of, of the imagination and keeps it more based in real life with real human beings and usually illustrates, as we'll see, illustrates Bible stories. So the things that are depicted are not imaginings of how something that you can't visualize, that you can't actually see, might look but rather depictions of people in stories who you can imagine how they might look, even if you don't know exactly or, or they weren't dressed like people would have been dressed in the Bible. Um, nonetheless, they're actually real people because the stories are about real people. Toward the end of the Middle Ages, the beginning of the Renaissance, this was already happening. One of the arguments against the theory that it's Protestantism that makes this happen with its greater emphasis on scripture and on the written word is that it was already happening before Luther. This painting is from, uh, from the very beginning of the 16th century, uh, about uh, 1513. So that would have been five years before the 95 Theses. Nobody had thought anything of Luther who was completely unknown at that point. Cranach was already a well-known artist. And this depicts a focus of piety that was popular in the late Middle Ages called, well, in English, we tend to call it the holy kinship. The German for it is heilige Zippe, and it represents Jesus' extended family. So in the center, you see the young woman in blue is Mary, She's, she, and, and the woman next to her is actually holding Jesus. That's the infant Jesus. That's Anne, Anna, Jesus' grandmother, Mary's mother. And then standing behind Mary is Joachim, who was, uh, was understood to be Mary's father. And so the extended picture includes Mary's whole family, uh, the cousins and, the, and, and all of that. I can't tell you who they all are. I should have looked it up. But on this side is Elizabeth with her child, John, who is John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. It was very important to people in those days to see Jesus as being a, in his incarnation as a human, as being embedded in a family. And I think it says quite a lot about the Middle Ages, in the Middle Ages, the growth of the sense of the family, especially among middle class and upper class people, that extended families were living together in large houses, at least well off people were, and the idea of this kinship network was, was extremely important. But you can see there are no halos, there's nothing supernatural looking about this. This could be a very upper, upper class. Uh, German families gathering. They're not dressed like Middle Easterners, they're dressed like wealthy Germans. Um, and it shows Jesus and, and Mary as living in prosperity. It's a long way from the, from the, uh, the soil of the stable and the, and, the, and the scraps in the manger to get to a, a, a picture of upper, upper class uh, splendor like this one. But it's still naturalistic in the sense that they're real people, they look like real people, and they make the point that, this, that Jesus in his incarnation was fully human and had relatives just like everybody else. As I mentioned, uh, Cranach was mostly paid by the elector, at least the largest part of his workshop's output that went to any one person, went to the court of the Dukes of Saxony, the electors of Saxony, who had a castle in Wittenberg at the end of town where the famous castle church is located and also had a much grander castle in Torgau, which was their principal residence about 50 miles away. And they would go back and forth between the two places. Wittenberg was the administrative capital and Torgau was the, the resident city for the Dukes. It was, it was closer to, uh, to good hunting for the elector, which was very important in those days. The main aristocratic recreation of the day was hunting. And, uh, 
and it was much more luxurious. It's, and even now, if you, if you go to Torgau, Schloss Hartenfels, the Elector's uh, castle, is the best, largest and best preserved complex of Renaissance residences in, in Germany. It's really a splendid place. You'll see a picture in a minute. The three electors who lived during the lifetime of the two Kronachs, and indeed of Martin Luther, uh, are in the background of this picture, in this triple portrait, also by Kronach. I should say everything you're going to see today is actually by Kronach. And uh, the one in the center is the famous one we all know about, Frederick the Wise, who, was, who protected Luther at the crucial moments in the time between the posting of the 95 Theses in 1517 through Luther's excommunication until, until the time when it looked as though the Reformation would at least not be wiped out by military force, by the emperor. But he died in 1525, so fairly early on in Luther's story, and was succeeded by his brother John, who is on the left. It, it, Frederick the Wise was 20 years older than Luther, he was old enough to have been his father. And, um, and John was about 10 years older than Luther, so already a senior figure, and had waited a long time in his brother's shadow to take the throne. His, his, his brother had no children. Well, his brother never married, so by definition had no legitimate children. Um, and so there weren't any heirs. So it passed to the younger brother. German uh, laws of inheritance for nobility were complicated, not really like the first son takes everything rules of England and the cultures we tend to know more about in the United States, they tended to divide everything among all the brothers. And so it was, it was always a point of tension when there were a number of, uh, of male descendants. But in this family, it worked well because the entire possessions of Frederick went to John, John the Steadfast, he's known in Lutheran literature, um, who, who ruled until 1532. So into the Reformation, but still not the whole way through. He died at a point of, of importance not long after the presentation of the Augsburg Confession, which he undertook uh, to do. And then he was succeeded in turn by his son. So the new next generation comes in with a man who took both his father's and his uncle's names, and it was John Frederick, John Frederick the Magnanimous of Saxony, who also actually did not um, outlive the Kronos, but died in 1554. So just a year after Lucas Cranach the Elder, who died in 1553, Lucas Cranach the Younger lived on until 1586. So, but these are the three electors for whom the Kron for whom Lucas Cranach the Elder was the court painter. Actually, Lucas Cranach the Younger, since his father was still alive until the third of these electors died, he was never appointed to be court painter in the technical sense. They continued to be customers and clients, the royal family but he didn't have that special status because in fact, by then, that branch of the Saxon royal family had lost the status that it had had previously as being electors of the Holy Roman Empire. In 1547, the emperor finally actually engaged in a war of German princes on his side against the Protestant princes and defeated them at a great battle near Torgau, practically within sight of Torgau in 1547, which caused uh, elector John Frederick, Duke John Frederick, to have to renounce his electoral title in favor of a cousin who lived in a different part of Saxony and to go in and become a prisoner of the emperor. He lived the last few years of his life as a well taken care of prisoner of Emperor uh, Charles V. And interestingly, because Cranach was his painter and part of his retinue, part of his household, Cranach went with him into captivity. So that was a, an interesting period in Cranach's life when by having to go with his prince along with the emperor, wherever the emperor went, he was exposed to some new things he'd never experienced in the rest of his life. He became actually friendly with the Italian painter Titian, who was associated with the emperor's household. So at the end of the day, the two painters would sit together and talk about stuff. And, uh, and it's really interesting to think of the possible learning that might have happened between those two remarkable, remarkable people. I put in here the 1525 wedding portrait of Martin Luther and his wife, Katharina von Bora, and not only because it represents the year that, uh, that Elector Frederick the Wise died, but also because portraits of Luther were probably the single, well, were certainly the single most common theme that Cranach painted. 
We've all seen many of them. I, I, I think I can safely say that I've seen 20 different versions of the painting of Luther in 20 different museums. And they were painted for, for profit. And this particular combination of the his and her kind of wedding picture set was very popular because people all over Europe who had, who had the resources, the rulers of other countries, they wanted to see what this crazy monk, the heretic and the runaway nun who got married looked like. So there was great demand for these paintings. The King of England wanted one. The Medici family in Florence wanted one. They all wanted to see what these people looked like, who they had read about. And since they didn't have the internet or the newspaper to look them up in, they had to order a painting from Cranach, who was happy to oblige for a fee. The ones that went to the Medici family are still in the Uffizi. They've been in the same place the whole time since. Cranach painted a lot of occasional paintings on secular themes. These are three good examples of it. On the right is a portrait of an unknown young woman of great wealth. We really don't know who she was, but she looks a lot like a lot of other portraits that Cranach painted that are certainly not all of the same young woman. Um, one, crit, one art historian has described Cranach's paintings, uh, portraits of women as being vapid, in part because they just all sort of do look alike. Um, he just wasn't really good at that. There was something that was hard for Cranach about, uh, especially the female portrait that made it, that makes them indistinct. Of course, it is also possible that the people who were asked to pose for him were of a type, because frequently these paintings were of the daughters or even of the mistresses of the rulers. And so one might assume that there was actually some resemblance among some of them uh, for various reasons. Um, but this painting is one, the, the woman with the grapes is uh, well enough known that uh, many, many centuries later, uh, Pablo Picasso did a version of it himself. He was, I should have brought that to show you. Um, on the other side is a, a mythological story of the huntress Diana and Apollo. So these are uh, mythical figures put in the background of a German landscape, of course, in a place where it would be much too cold to, to be dressed like that. Um, but scenes from the hunt, because of course Diana was a huntress, so and hunting was the major activity. So hunting stories were important uh, to the prince at the time. And in the center is an actual hunting picture. So imagine this: that the Elector of Saxony invites his his twenty best friends from the nobility of northern Germany to come and spend a couple of weeks in my big castle, and we will hunt together as noblemen should do. And they would go out in great groups with horses and, and hounds and all the things one needs to drive the deer into the right place so that you can hunt them easily and that everyone can kill one without any trouble. And, uh, and this is what they're doing. They're driving the deer toward the bank of the river so that they can shoot at them more easily. Um, they have crossbows and spears. Um, generally, firearms were not really useful for hunting in those days because they were too clumsy and you couldn't aim very well, you were just wasting your gunpowder and more likely to hurt yourself. So they, they still hunted with, uh, with crossbows. And you can see a man down here with his crossbow. And a, a painting like this was a souvenir of the event. This depicts an actual hunt that happened. I mean, obviously nobody got an aerial view of it, but, the, um, but it's an imaginary depiction of, of the prince's hunt. And you can tell by the fact that people are, are out of proportion to each other and that there's always a figure in the middle who's the star of the show. You can tell the man on the horse in the middle is the one who is the host of this particular one. And you know who it is and where it is because that's Schloss Hartenfels in Torgau in the background. So it's, uh, it commemorates a great week in the life of uh, Elector John the Steadfast. Kranach also went on to do a lot of uh, mythical allegorical stories, but also biblical. So this one, and you can see that part of the purpose in this for the artist is to be able to demonstrate their mastery of, of the human nude, that it was a way of, of showing off skill, that the pictures, pictures of Adam and Eve were enormously popular, not just because of their theological meaning, but because of the way they could show off the talent of the artist. And there are easily a dozen um, Kranach versions of the story of the fall of, of Adam and Eve because of that. In some cases, we suspect that even the Eve figure might have been modeled on someone in particular, that it was 
a code, coded way of being able to show a nude of somebody without actually saying who it was. On the other side um, is the, the, um, the myth of, um, of Diana and Actaeon, another Diana story, where the, uh, the hunter, Actaeon, is on, on, by himself hunting in the woods and he happens accidentally on a pond in which the huntress goddess Diana is bathing with her nymphs. And in that moment of shock, when he realizes he's gazing upon the, uh, upon the great huntress Diana, there's a moment of confusion while the nymphs try to figure out what to do and to find something to throw over her to conceal her from him. And she, in her moment of panic, she's the one in the front who's still wearing her jewelry in the pool, um, splashes water on him, which turns him into a dappled deer. So he's already been transformed into the deer here with the antlers. And, uh, and at that moment, his hounds, the dogs he's brought with him for the hunt, turn on him because he's now become the prey. So he's the victim. Because anyway, these were stories that not only were relevant to hunters, but also told kind of a moral and were an opportunity to show off some, what did we used to call a cheesecake. Um, the, um, but to the religious paintings, and these are the important ones. Here again, Cranach is moving toward themes that are specifically biblical. Of course, the crucifixion was a staple of art throughout the whole of the Christian history from the fifth century onward. But I put this picture of the centurion from the Gospel of Mark. Um, Cranach did at least six of these paintings. This one is from the um, Yale University Art Gallery. And, uh, and then a picture of the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist, which was originally on a tombstone. And then this, the one of his most popular images ever, there are again, half a dozen of these easy, easily, uh, of the woman taken in adultery. So you can see the people around her, angry people shouting that she should be stoned. Here's a man with a pot full of stones all ready to do it. And, uh, and Jesus is telling them that the one without sin uh, should cast the first stone. And we know this because that's what it says at the top. This was also uh, common of the time and for Cranach to actually put in on, this, on the painting the words that are being said, like a caption or a voice bubble. The top of the baptismal one shows, this is my son of whom I am well pleased. And of course, the little faint line of white that's going out from the centurion's mouth says, surely this man was the son of God. And uh, so they were a little bit cartoonish from our perspective in that regard. They don't leave anything to the imagination. You know what's going on in the story. And even if you didn't, you could read the description. The ones I really wanted to bring to you today and are the focus, the main focus of this are panels that illustrate Lutheran theology specifically. And in this case, the juxtaposition of law and gospel and how God works through both to bring sinners to salvation. Um, I'll show you a couple of them. This is the, the first one. It's in the city of Gotha in Germany, G-O-T-H-A. And um, it was probably not painted to be put up in a church, although it might have been. Uh, it might have been in a, a, a private home or in some other public location. Actually, religious paintings, especially ones on moral topics, were frequently put in city halls and places of governance that were, that were public areas because they were thought to be particularly edifying. Uh, at the bottom, there are biblical texts actually painted on the bottom. You can't read them. They're too small for you, but it, it basically explains what's going on above. Over time, these become less important because people actually know the story well enough to not need any explanation. But the whole purpose of doing it in pictures is to get away from that anyway, is to get to have people's immediate uh, reaction. So the panel is, is really divided into two parts by a tree, which goes all the way from the top to the bottom. On one side, the tree is dead. On the other side, the tree is alive. This is the side in which the unrepentant or unsaved sinner lives. And as you can see, the unsaved sinner, who is this man in the foreground, is in some distress. He is being driven around by a skeleton and a demon. The skeleton has a pike forcing him forward. So he's under the constraint in this case of sin and death. So looked at, that's a, of course a theological abstraction. He's under the, he does not have the refuge in Christ that a saved person would. And so he's driven by his own passions, 
by, by the circumstances around him. He does not have control. Even though Moses over here has the laws and is telling him what is right, it's not having much effect. That, that death and the devil still have the upper hand in this. In the background, you see how it got this way. It starts up here with uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, the fall of humanity. It, there's an illustration here of the story from the book of Numbers about the people of Israel being set upon by the poisonous serpent, the venomous serpents, and Moses erecting the serpent, bronze serpent, on a, on a staff in order and telling them if they look upon this, they will live. So it's a test of faith. Some did and lived and some didn't and died. But these are both about tests that humankind endured and essentially failed. I mean, this, it is the implication of this is that that was not enough. Even though Moses could rescue the people from venomous serpents, the law alone was not enough to rescue them from captivity to sin. So this is the side of judgment. And here's Jesus in sitting in judgment on, on the universe, surrounded by a rainbow, and the saved on either side, and angels up above. There's a, you can barely see it because the, you're, you're not close enough, but on, out of Jesus' two ears are coming two symbols. One is a, a lily. That's the one it's harder to see because it's white. And it represents uh, judgment to, to salvation, being chosen to be elect, to be saved. The other is a sword, which is a sort of punishment. So, that, so it represents Jesus making judgment on the whole, on the whole of everything. And this is the, the side of judgment. On the other side, or the law. On the other side, the side of the gospel. Again, you have the, the man, the, the pen, this, in this case, the penitent sinner, who is listening to John the Baptist, who is pointing, of course, at the crucified. But we see Jesus in more than one guise at the same time. He's crucified here. He's resurrected above. And the grave out of which he came, the tomb is down below. An emblem, of course, for the Lamb of God. That's what John is saying. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And down below, death and the devil from the other panel have been vanquished, and they lie dead on the ground in front of the tomb. There's a little bit of backstory to this one, too, in that up here, you can very hard to see, there's an angel in the sky who has come down and is telling the shepherds on the hillside about the one who has come for them. So then this is telling the good news in all those ways. The angel to the shepherds, John the Baptist to the people, Jesus himself through his death and resurrection. And so this lucky man on this side is going to find his way to faith. There's no direct sign of his reward. There's no real picture of heaven on this side. It's just about faith. And this is where it, it could be argued this is Reformation art because it's not about getting you over the gate into heaven. It's about showing you how you get there which is not through actions, but through faith, faith in, in Christ. This is a detail of the law that you can see the serpents here a little better in the background. And a detail of the other side where you can see the shepherds a little bit more close up here, the sheep, the shepherds asleep, some of them waking up and this angel with a, with a holding a ribbon that probably, if it were big enough, you could see, would say, I announce to you glad tidings of great joy. And of course, a typical German community in the back. Um, this is the second panel I want to show you. It's a similar thing, but Connor has made some important changes when he went on to paint this one. No longer are there two men, one bound for bad and the other bound for good. There's only one in the middle, and he's being given a choice. It's still Moses and John the Baptist, but they're both talking to him at the same time. And you'll notice they're both pointing in the same direction. Even Moses is pointing out of his picture of the law and into the picture of the gospel. Over here, there's on this side, the, the law side, there's no, there's no demon. There's only death. So it is death that's being held up as the great anxiety of humankind, the great fear the grave that, that everyone dreads. Again, the same stories on the inside, Adam and Eve, the fall of humanity, the serpents in the wilderness again. And this time you see Moses on the top of the mountain receiving the law directly from God. So, so in a sense, I think that the, the whole action of the story is about what God does. And instead of being two opposite panels, an either or, 
they're sort of a both and because God is working in all of this, giving the law. Moses then still pointing to the future. You know, his hand doesn't really get across the tree, but he's still indicating the direction where John the Baptist is going to announce the Jesus who will come. Here, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection are separated and reversed in position, that the, the, the resurrection is down below. Again, of course, death and the devil are, are underfoot, underfoot for Jesus, who is the sign of victory. The Lamb of God is on top of the tomb this time at the foot of the cross. And then we have this mountain on which is Mary, but not a Mary in glory, but a very human Mary. No halo, nothing special, just the emblem of the Christians who have gone ahead, who are welcoming the saved into heaven, which of course is, is objectified by these rings of clouds with bright golden sunlight inside. So the, the destination of the saved is this wonderful place where Mary already is ready to say welcome, and you get there through the cross and resurrection. Again, the an angel of the Annunciation to the Shepherds is in the background. So some of this is consistent, but I think it's an interesting development of a shift away from it being just either or to the situation of the human being always caught in between the two impulses and left to some degree to decide for themselves. Here's a close-up of that man in the middle, um, another one of Moses getting the law, just so you can, the light's not quite right for this, and of Mary there at the top of the mountain. Then this was done in much cheaper form as a woodcut that could be printed on a piece of paper and sold for a penny. And in this woodcut, which is the later, this is later than either of the two paintings, Kronoff has done much of the same stuff. You can see all the same thing, the tree with the live on one side, dead on the other, judgment up here, Adam and Eve, the, um, the souls here, their souls in torment. So this man is being driven toward eternal torment by the, by the spear held by death. And the devil is going to pounce on him with, with claws. And, and to no avail, Moses holds up the law as a way out. It's, it's important that Moses is next to the tree in the middle because he's as close as you can get to the, to the gospel side, the salvation side. On this side, they've decided to make a lot of things that you'd have to explain much more literal. Um, you see, again, the annunciation of the angel to the shepherds on the hillside. Um, but here, the serpents in the wilderness have been moved to the gospel side. I think this is also very significant and, and has something to do with the fact that Philip Melanchthon, among others, used the symbol of the bronze serpent as his own emblem because he and Martin Luther both saw that story as being a type or a, a symbol for Christ, that the serpent raised up on the, on the uh, pole is like Jesus being lifted up on the cross. And you look on them and live. That to understand that what was done has not to, nothing to do with your own merit or your own ability, but simply trust in what has been done for you. And so I think that's a very significant shift that the, uh, the number story has gone over here. Of course, again, the, the uh, resurrection below with the overcome death and the devil. Mary still is here. Her prayers are going up. But here, in this interesting way, on the cross, Christ's blood, which is shooting out of his side wound and somehow connecting with the dove of the Holy Spirit, becomes the water of baptism, which hits the faithful person down here and prepares him for the faith that he is to live out. So this doesn't leave much to the imagination. This is like a, this is a dream for the simple mind in a sense. It's one that doesn't require uh, too much explaining, although we're not used to this imagery, so it, it needs some explaining for us. But for people in Luther's time, it would have been very obvious what he was trying to do. Now, I wanna bring this all together because we're about out, I'm about out of time uh, for this part. We'll take a break. In, in a few minutes and then come back and have a time for questions and answers if you want. I want to bring this all together by saying that, that when Cronach and, uh, and Elector John Frederick were forced into captivity after 1547, it only took a few years, maybe three years before they were released. But Elector John Frederick, because he had had to give up the title of Elector of Saxony, no longer had the right to live in Wittenberg because that was the place associated with that title. He'd lost that castle. 
So he lived in Weimar. He said that's where the Duke settled and uh, became the new capital of a branch of the family that becomes uh, uh, Saxe Gotha, um, sorry, um, Sax Saxony uh, Weimar. There's a, the, the, the Saxon royal family divides into a whole bunch of branches you don't need to know about, except that one of them ultimately are the ancestors of Prince Albert, who married Queen Victoria, and, and others. They live on in some ways even today. But the branch that had been the electors of Saxony and Wittenberg become the, the Weimar branch. And so that's where that's why Lucas Cranach died there, is because he was still with his elector in 1553. When he died, the elector himself died in 1554. Unlike his uncle uh, and his father before him, he had a relatively short life, uh, probably due to the absolutely prodigious amounts of food and drink that he was capable of consuming. He was legendary among the princes of his time for his capacity. Um, and it is at least one of them believed that he had spent half of his reign drunk. But in spite of that, he was a very firm Lutheran. And since he had grown up since the Reformation, he was a Lutheran his whole life, unlike his, his father and uncle before him, who had been Catholic in the sense they had been part of the larger, older church and had chosen Frederick the Wise, not so much, but his brother certainly had thrown their weight behind the Reformation, behind Luther. And, uh, and then John Frederick really was the first generation of cradle Lutherans, uh, in a sense. So, so the end of the Kranoff story isn't, doesn't end with the lecture John Frederick. Um, it, during the time after that, until it was possible for him to go back to Wittenberg, Lucas Kranoff the Younger carried on the legacy in Nuremberg, an imperial free city not too far away in Franconia where he served on the city council and had a, a, a successful life for the few years that, that was necessary for the heat to be off in Wittenberg so that he could go back and claim his family's possessions there, reestablish himself. He died in Wittenberg. He's buried in the, in the, castle, in the city church next to the altarpiece, the great altarpiece of the, of the Last Supper. That was one of his last works, shows Luther at the, at the table um, of the Last Supper. And on the wings of the altar shows... Uh, Baptism and Holy Communion, Philip Melanchthon, or, or not baptism and confession, Philip Melanchthon baptizing a baby on one side and the pastor of the city church, Johannes Bugenhagen, hearing a confession on the other side. So the three sort of sacramental understandings of the Lutheran church were in that. That was the great last work of, uh, uh, of his time there. But possibly the greatest masterpiece of the Kronach family is this altarpiece in Weimar that was commissioned for the tomb of Elector John Frederick. The whole back end of the church around the altar was a, a grave area for noble people. And Elector John Frederick's family built an enormous monumental sculptured tomb. Um, but the, over the altar, they commissioned this very, very large painting. And it is that same law and gospel pattern as we saw on those tables, except this time it's the cross of Christ that is the tree in the center that divides the two sides. But some of the conventional stuff is still there. In this case, it's, uh, it's uh, the burning bush story and not, the, uh, and not the, the descent of the law. But you see in the background, this same poor man is being driven by the fear of death uh, toward Jesus, who here has conquered death and the devil and as the lamb of God is being presented to the saved Moses now gets this little tiny position in the back, although he's now on the gospel side and not on the law side. And the story of the serpents and all that and the shepherds is still over here on this side where it belongs. Now, this painting was designed by Lucas Cranach the Elder before he died, but it was executed by his son, Lucas Cranach the Younger. So this is one of the few works we know that they both worked on. And when Lucas Cranach the Elder designed it, it was less lopsided than it is now because it only showed John the Baptist here pointing to Jesus and Martin Luther. But the death of Lucas Cranach the Elder caused his son, I guess he must have asked permission, but he, he decided to paint his father in between the two, photoshopped him in, sort of, uh, which is why they're too close together. It's a little awkward. Yeah. And originally, this arc of blood from the side of Jesus was supposed to land on Martin Luther's Bible on a verse describing salvation 
through Jesus' sacrifice. Um, but it couldn't anymore because Kronos in the way. So instead, it splashes on his head. And it's an opportunity for the artist to show that his father was a truly deeply believing man who was taken up in, in God's mercy through Jesus' sacrifice to be with the saved. So it becomes the ultimate tribute by the artist to his own father, in a sense. You can see it a little better here, this arc of blood, which on some pressure, just before the death of Jesus, of course, because you've had to have, have a beating heart to have that happen, it lands right on Kronos. But if you followed the arc, describe the rest of the arc, it would go directly to the page of scripture. So, so we become witnesses to this salvation story, in this case, up close. If you ever go to Weimar, be sure to go to the city church to see this, because it is monumental. It is an enormous painting and really splendid. And it's been recently restored. So it is very vivid. Again, more closely, you can see the little splash here at the top. The Kronos, both of them, use the symbol of a winged serpent. And at different points, it appears with a crown on its head. And then it also sometimes appears with a ring in its mouth. But this is the emblem they used to sign their paintings. And the whole workshop used it, and both father and son used it. So it's impossible to know from it actually who painted what, except that over time there are some variations to it. And it came by, by from a fluke that one day in a, uh, a moment of happiness and generosity, Elector Frederick the Wise gave Lu Lucas Cranach, the elder, uh, a piece of jewelry that someone had given him or that he had somehow. And he gave it to him as you know, a form of payment, but also as a sort of form of favor, sign of favor. And on this was carved a winged serpent. It had no particular meaning that that was what that was, but it, it was the meaning to Krana, the gift from his own prince, that made him sign his, his picture from that point onward with this emblem. Thank you for your attention. I'm glad to be able to present this to you today. I propose a 10 minute break. And those who have the stomach for conversation can come back then. Thank you, those of you who are seeing us online. No pressure. I'm going to go back to Larry. Just to be safe. I had a question. Um, am I on? Yeah. Um, Dr. Irwin, I had a question about the, uh, the first three slides and the changes in position of Jesus's arms, if there was any <laughs> significance about that. Yes, whether the, uh, in the slides of the, of the Holy Trinity, whether the position of Jesus's arms means anything, I don't think it does. Um, it is interesting, though, because there is a, I don't know whether Kronoff just painted them from memory and, and they varied naturally or whether he thought, well, that looks uncomfortable or something else looks more natural, I'll make it better. Um, the other place where I see that and it is in the pictures of the woman taken in adultery because that's almost always the same tableau. Jesus is in the middle. He has the woman by the arm. He's holding her hand and she's usually kind of elaborately dressed and everyone else is kind of plain. And they, of course, all look angry. And, um, but I, they, these pictures are sometimes so similar, it's hard for me to tell them apart looking at a bunch of them on a screen. So I, I can figure out which one is which by how far her hand is going up or down, because each one is a little different. But I think that's just the very natural variations that came when the artist would do the preliminary sketch or cartoon that for which they set up the, the, uh, the way that the picture is. Uh, Frank, yeah. I know that most of the paintings, if not all, are in Germany. Are any oh, disseminated over the rest of the world? Oh. or Are yeah. there, and do you know where they are in the States? Oh, yes. They're all over the place. Um, I would say that every, almost every major museum, uh, in the United States at least, probably has a chrono. For one thing, there are so many of them. Um, some of the themes get repeated again and again and again. The Norton Simon in LA has a, an enormous Adam and Eve one. Um, 
the, uh, that one of Jesus with the centurion, Jesus on the cross and the centurion's confession from the Gospel of Mark, that's in the Yale Art Gallery in New Haven. Um, there's also one in the National Gallery in Washington. Uh, there are portraits of Luther in three or four places in the U.S. There is a, a big chrono in the Cleveland Museum, too, the Cleveland Art Museum. I don't remember what's in Philadelphia. It's been, Rob and I haven't been since the pandemic, but, uh, but I'm sure, pretty sure there is at least one there. And as I say, the most common ones are pictures of, of Luther. There's also another reason that pictures of Cranach are pretty widespread, and that is that they were, because Cranach was a German painter associated with a time in German history that is pretty important to the rest of the world. Um, it's a little unfortunate, but they were popular with the Nazis. Um, not Cranach's fault, but, and not because of the themes in the pictures, but because he was German. And so a lot of the paintings stolen from museums around Europe during the time of German occupation, and also those that were taken from Jewish folks who were forced to sell their property or give up their property and leave the country. Um, a lot of, of paintings came onto the market because of that theft. And in the post-war period, there's been a lot of sorting out of who, what really belongs to whom and who should be compensated for those. Like the one that we hear about in the US is the argument about the Adam and Eve paintings in the Norton Simon in LA, which were purchased on the up and up by, the, by Norton Simon, but which uh, were probably looted from, by the Nazis. So, or certainly looted by the Nazis. The question is whether the people who are claiming to have the right to the compensation for them are connected in the right ways and all of that. But I think that's being litigated even now. So chronos are everywhere. Um, I make it a point whenever I go to a new museum to look and see if they have one. And, uh, and I, I can say, if you have an eye to see, you'll find them everywhere you look. And of course, in Europe, they're everywhere. I would say that we all now have an eye to see. Yeah, there you go. Once again, in the, in the Trinity paintings, the one on the right, uh, it looks like some sort of pliers or something in one of the angel's hands. Yes. What is the significance of that? That was the pliers in the hands of one of the cherubs is, the, um, is one of the conventional signs of the passion. Um, they're the, the, uh, the pliers with which the nails were extracted so Jesus could be taken from the cross. Yeah. That's vivid. <laughs> And I have a question about the use and the context for a number of the teaching pieces, especially the law and gospel. Were they ever actually used to teach? That is, some, they would be there and somebody would stand in front of them and begin to teach out of them. Um, I don't know for sure. Uh, we, I don't know of any record of anybody doing kind of what I did in the sense of standing with them and giving a lecture on them. But I can vividly imagine in the normal day-to-day uh, -day life of people going in and out of the main hall of, its, of the town hall or something like that, uh, a, a grandmother or a grandfather taking a child and saying, look at this, and explaining uh, what it meant. Um, I think for the most part, they were meant to be kind of silent witnesses, which is why the text on the bottom, too, makes it clear that you know, there's just no ambiguity about what they stand for. I was telling somebody during the break, though, that one of the reasons I've always enjoyed leading tours to the Luther sites and, and to see some of these is that the people I've taken with me have always been people from my network. So they're, they tend to be church folks and, and mostly Lutherans. And so you don't have to explain who Jesus is and what Moses' significance is. You just have to say, this is the angel speaking to the shepherds, and they know instantly what that's about and can, can draw the connection. And unfortunately, that's been lost for a lot of tourists. And if you go to a, uh, on a tour today and you're not with a church group, the guide might not even explain these things. So who's next? Yes. Do you think the Cranachs had any exposure to um, iconic, I mean, in the, the literal sense, Eastern icon type Christian art? Because some of the things I see in some of these pictures, you're probably familiar with the icon of the harrowing of hell. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it looks a lot like that. Yeah, the question was, in case you didn't all hear it, was whether Cranach had, uh, took any uh, inspiration or influence from 
the Eastern Christian custom of icon painting and the styles of icons. Um, I don't doubt that he was somewhat familiar with them, but I think that his acquaintance with them was most likely through his exposure to Italian art. We're not 100% sure, but there's, a, there's at least one theory that he studied for a while in Italy because some of the, the techniques he picked up at least are Italian inspired. And the place that people from Northern Europe tended to go first was Venice because it was relatively straightforward to go to Innsbruck through the Alps uh, south to Venice. And, um, and so there is a possibility. And if he had been in Venice, he would have seen icons. He would have seen medieval Italian paintings done in the style of the East. He would have seen the mosaics of St. Mark's. So he would have a, some, and you know, there's a, I'm not enough of, a, of an art historian to get into the controversy about what makes a painting really a Renaissance painting as opposed to a medieval painting. And I think Cronin is really seen as somebody who bridges that, who's a transitional figure. Because in some ways, his, his images are always a little stylized. There's always something in the picture that's exaggerated, a bit beyond the natural. So they're natural, naturalistic, but they're not perfectly natural. The people are a little too long and thin or something. You know, there's, there's the shapes are not quite, the, and I don't think it's a lack of skill. I think it was a desire to draw attention to some aspects over others. And, uh, and that's kind of medieval, is to do this symbolically. The question is the, the, the glowing uh, uh, aura around Jesus on the cross in one of those paintings, whether that's an invention of Cronox or conventional, is really fairly conventional um, uh, in that lots of artists try. You know, the, one of the hardest things was to depict the glory that hit the eye of the believer on beholding Jesus or the resurrection. You know, we, 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 even now, there has never been a fully satisfying artistic rendition of the transfiguration from my standpoint. Nothing lives up to the text, to the description in the gospel of Jesus being dazzling. Um, people have tried again and again. And, and actually, it's interesting that the transfiguration does, Luther, Kronoff never painted the transfiguration as far as I know. Uh, it was just too hard beyond his technical ability. How was Cronach's art um, seen by the Roman church? Yes, did you all hear that? How is Cronach's art seen by the Roman church? That's a very good question, because in fact, Cronach continued to paint for Catholic patrons and clients even after, after the Reformation had begun. That tapers off over time, mostly because communication tapers off. The division of Europe into kind of a cold war between Protestant states and Catholic ones meant that the, the normal avenues of communication were somewhat disrupted. They weren't as good as they'd been before. But Cronach uh, but continued to have customers. He actually did, I, did, I can't, couldn't show you, of course, the whole range of his work, but he continued to paint some fairly conventional pictures of saints, individual saints, on commission from particular uh, church leaders. But that also, as if, once he became famous as somebody who was associated with Luther, I mean, Wittenberg was synonymous with Luther, was synonymous with heresy for a large part of the European world. So, so they weren't as, as inclined to reach out to him for pictures. Um, but it also remember what I said about the, the popularity of the Luther portraits. People who hated Luther ordered those pictures because they, they, were, they might have been even more curious than the people who admired him. And to see these, what these people actually looked like was important. The Medici could never be said to be supporters of the Reformation, and yet they wanted one too. I, 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 I delight in the idea that somewhere in the Vatican, there was a picture of Luther and Katharina from Bora. <laughs> but it could also have been good propaganda for the Reformation that countered to the myths of what would happen if uh, an ex-monk married uh, a former nun, exactly. what would happen. Yes, that they didn't have horns. Mm -hmm. And that they were 
alive and thriving. But you know, even as 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 you know, in particular that even in the time, disinformation was was prevalent. And there were people writing books about how Luther was the the child of of a demon and a and a female bathhouse attendant. And, and I mean, because that was people were buying that because they wanted that to be true, because it was making sense of, the, of their world. And that when Luther died, it was very important for the friends who were gathered at the deathbed to immediately put into print the description of his peaceful death, because the whole world was expecting hell to break open and the devil to come and get him personally. I mean, at least the Catholic world was. And, uh, and so propaganda and counter-propaganda are really essential. Yeah. In the, the title of your lecture, The Gospel Made Visible, uh, at least in the case of the Chronics, it depends a lot on sort of the centrality of altar paintings. But you could say that I'm curious in terms of with the demise of the presence of altar paintings in Lutheran churches, what would you say happened to that tradition of the gospel made visible? I mean, I can't think of a major Lutheran painter of any stature comparable to the Chronics until you get to someone like Caspar David Friedrich. In the yeah, yeah, it is until you get to the 19th century, and especially the, the ones they call the Nazarenes, who begin to do uh, religious art in a Protestant vein that is of high quality. I think, you know, there's a, uh, I'm, I'm really interested not just in painting, but also in the whole material culture of, of religious life. So what people's buildings look like, what kind of furniture they had, what kind of communion vessels they used, all the things that are physical about church life, because I think those tell us about what people thought they were doing in the ritual actions and all of that. And uh, one of the things that's most interesting about Lutheranism in the two centuries after Luther is how little creativity there is in Lutheran churches about that stuff. They tended to use the old things until they were unusable, and then often would replace them with new things that look just like the old. Ones. So, I mean, we make jokes about Lutherans changing light bulbs, but, um, <laughs> but the fact is, uh, uh, one of the, the scholars on this topic at a conference in Germany a few years ago gave a paper in which he called the preservative power of Lutheranism, <laughs> which sounds like an, a highfalutin idea, except he really meant that Lutherans don't throw anything away. <laughs> and that what happened, for example, when you go to a, um, a museum of decorative arts or applied arts in Europe, in Northern Europe, and you find a great collection of medieval and uh, early modern vestments from churches, you know, chasubles and all that stuff, they're almost always from Lutheran churches. Not because those things were used all that time, but because on the day they decided not to use them anymore, they packed them up in trunks and put them in the attic with paper in between each layer for their descendants to find 200 years later. And that's why they were preserved, that the things that were used disintegrated from use and the things that were put away were saved. And so we have a lot of this early Lutheran stuff because at some point they decided it was too old fashioned to use, but too good to throw away. Yeah. So we have one over here who hasn't been before, I think. Did you have a question? Sorry, I thought you, you might've just been gesturing. Well. The, we were just oh, we were just uh, talking about the the artwork that is above our altar at ELC and who, in Frederick and who painted it and when and it must have been in what the mid 1800s. You have a very vivid picture of the ascension, don't you? Well, but we had a debate about that in Bible study the other day. Is is he ascending or is he descending? To you know, what's your frame of thought on that? Depends well, on whether it's Advent or Easter. <laughs> I think that, that's a good answer. I'll remember that. I'll remember that. But I was just noting out of all of the instances of salvation that that Prana could have used, he is really fixating on serpents. And was there a particular reason for that? On, this, on serpents? Yes. 
over and over and over in his paintings. Was there a particular reason why he preferred that particular instance? That's a good question. I, I the, the emphasis on the serpent. Of course, it's a it's a very traditional symbol of of evil, but but also in the in the larger context of the of typology and the symbolism, it also has meant healing. Yeah, uh, for some people at, at some times, that's why the the rod of a scapulus has has a serpent on it. Um, and there's a very, I think, very compelling theory that a bishop's crozier, that the crook on the top is not supposed to represent a shepherd's crook, but rather the serpent on the stick. And because a lot of medieval croziers, the end of the hook has a mouth and a tongue and eyes. And so I think that's what it's Moses. It's really the staff of Moses. Uh, but, but like lots of things, more than one meaning can be attached to a symbol. Um, I maybe Kranach also, like me, had a set especially vivid fear of snakes. And so that's something that was really compelling um, to him. But that's a, that is a good question. I want to go back for a second to the part of Eric, too, and say that uh, it is interesting that Kranach shifts to this painting of panels pictures that tell a story, which were not necessarily meant for altarpieces, although they could have been, especially the ones that um, only tell one story, like the woman taken in adultery, they could also have been in churches. Um, the thing I didn't show you was that the second most popular and often shown as a pair with the woman taken in adultery is the one of Jesus surrounded by children, let the children come unto me. And uh, there are lots of versions of that too. But anyway, I think the thing is that Altarpieces weren't being commissioned because most places had them already. And although there was some destruction in the course of the Reformation, the iconoclasm typical of, of the British Isles was not present in North Germany in the same way, at least to the same degree. And, um, and when churches decided they didn't want altarpieces anymore, they often gave them back to the donors or to the family of the fa that originally contributed them. And so they went into private possession and ended up in museums. That's why we see so many today. But, um, but I do think because of that, it is interesting that that final big altarpiece, the one in Weimar, is an altarpiece with the story of the law and gospel on it, because that's the only one I can think of that is both. That is both this didactic and also a focus of the worship of the community uh, every week. Yeah. Go back to Eric. I forget the name of the art historian, but within the, like the last 15 years, published a book that argued that with the, the reformation of the image during the reformation, is that uh, um, no longer were there paintings or images put up, but actually you had chiseled into the walls, you know, sort of like uh, biblical passages, so that uh, the word made visible uh ended up being just sort of you could say sort of in a biblicistic manner bible passages put up in place of having uh uh, uh figural paintings mm -hmm. most of the arguments that historians have made about a about something ending and something new beginning have been overdrawn in the sense that the the process is usually much more gradual and, and varies from place to place. In Lutheran churches in North Germany, at least, um, it remained the custom to decorate the interior of churches with pictures. Um, now, the thing that changes, and what and in particular, let me tell you where these are, that one of the things that happened after the Reformation was that a lot of medieval churches, which continued to be used, were remodeled for Protestant worship, which meant that they had balconies built, sometimes way high up toward the vaults, so that as many people as possible could be in the space at the same time and hear the sermon, and of course see the preacher in the altar. But the emphasis became on having more people in the building at once, because you didn't go to a private mass, which would have happened, several of them might have happened a day, any given day, you went to the Sunday service with everybody else. And so they needed a greater capacity. And so what happens if you've been, if any of you have traveled or probably seen these churches, 
the one in Eisenach is a very good example. It was a, uh, a late medieval hall church, two side aisles that are as high as the center aisle. So big open Gothic room. And now it has two rows of balconies on each side. Um, and on the front of each one, there are of course panels that, uh, that keep you from falling out and that were space for decoration. And so they would alternate biblical stories and pictures with verses from scripture that illustrated those stories. So you've got, you've got the, the medieval poor person's Bible for the illiterate, but next to it, you've got the, 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 the beginner's Bible of, of selected verses that, that ordinary people could pick out. So as literacy is increasing in the, in the centuries after Luther, the use of words on the wall is increasing too, but it's never complete. They don't completely do away with the other. There's a gradual evolution. Um, it is though in, in the parts of Europe that were more influenced by Calvinism, uh, there was a stronger desire to remove images just because they are vain and distracting and, and sensual in a way that they, they don't they don't stimulate the right part of the human mind when you should be listening to the word of god so stained glass windows stuff like that go fall out of favor in some places they're even destroyed although uh, not everywhere again the the preservative power of people who have paid for these and grown up with them is pretty great but um but that's a place where this uh, iconographic tradition in the Calvinist world pretty much ends, and it's replaced by plainness. And if you do have to adorn a space, you put up a tablet that actually has the Ten Commandments on it, as in colonial churches, where you'll see the Ten Commandments or the Creed or something painted on the wall behind the altar. Um, the word becomes a, a decorative thing in that regard. But Lutherans really do keep, keep that going longer. Um, well, one of the things that happens, of course, when they come to the United States is that they don't have artists of that quality and they're not well off. They're not wealthy people for the most part. So you can't bring that with you. The great Baroque churches of Saxony don't get recreated in the United States because we couldn't do it here. The one thing that we could do was music. So we get, you know, Bach, we get the, the Moravian tradition of music, which is essentially Lutheran. We get all of that because that's easily transportable. A person with the skill can find a keyboard instrument and has the has the notes, they can do that. There, how about Larry in the back again and then back here to the front? Sorry to make you run, Shell. I was just uh, curious, Dr. Irwin, if um, the chronics were subject to some of the tendencies of the period like anti-Jewish imagery or anti-papal imagery? Yes. The short answer to that is yes. I mean, not so much in, in any of the things I showed you, but, but in uh, uh, chronics, woodcuts illustrating, uh, for, that were made to illustrate the, the book of Revelation in Luther's uh, first tran German translation of the New Testament. Uh, there were, the book is not very extensively illustrated, except for that one book, which has a whole series of, of woodcuts that illustrate various dramatic visual aspects of the story of Revelation. And, uh, and the one that shows the great dragon, always, the dragon always wears the Pope's three level crown. And there's some things like that. There are visual symbols that associate the, the papacy with the Antichrist. There's a little bit less direct anti-Jewish stuff in the visual arts, although some is there. And one of those characteristics is that, as I mentioned, the, the person in one of those pictures who is, is not bound for heaven, but for hell is wearing yellow as a sign of, uh, of being bad. Uh, Judas is almost always wearing yellow. And sometimes Judas is wearing a hat that was associated with the kind of hat that Jews sometimes wore in Luther's world. So there's, there is some of that. Luther himself didn't, I mean, he wrote terrible things about the Jews, but one of his earliest writings um, was a meditation on the passion of Christ in which the very first line is, some people, when they think of Good Friday, begin to hate the Jews, but that is not the point. And goes on to describe how this was, was not about them. Of course, later in his life, when he thought the whole world was, was breaking apart in evil ways, uh, he was less optimistic. But, um, but it doesn't show up as much in the visual arts. 
It is interesting, though, that when they do want to depict Old Testament figures and they want to show them literally as, as the people of Israel, they often dress them in ways they think, in ways contemporary Jews would have dressed. Or, and often they have banners or something on their clothes that is supposed to be in Hebrew letters, but they have no clue what Hebrew letters actually look like. So they're kind of just like gibberish symbols. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I just want to disagree a little bit with what you said about art going away. I mean, obviously, my personal experience is a very limited sample, <laughs> but the Lutheran, I mean, I'm not exactly a cradle Lutheran. I wasn't baptized till I was two, but uh, the church where I was baptized had a oil painting. And I, I, my recollection of it is that it was two or three times life size. But since I was only this big, <laughs> I may be overestimating it. But, you know, it was come to come on to me. And it said that at the bottom, you know, white robe, red, microphone, sorry, <laughs> red over thing. And, you know, he had his hands out and that was above the altar. And, you know, the altar was like right. forgettable to a child. But so the picture was vivid. Right. Yeah. I mean, that was. Yeah. Well, I will say that there is a revival in the 19th century when Lutheran churches were being built very quickly in the United States and there was some there was some money for it. Mm -hmm. They would order paintings, especially from Germany, the paintings of Hoffman, you know, the famous one of Jesus in Gethsemane with his hands on the stone like this kneeling at the stone that was copied many times, but it's uh, based on a prototype by a German artist in the mid 19th century. So the 19th century is the exception. That's when there's a revival in church art in the Lutheran world. Um, and if you go to big churches in Scandinavia that, that were built in the last half of the 19th century, you'll see some monumental paintings of uh, really beautiful ones uh, from that. But there's this kind of slow period between Luther, before the Baroque, which, which focused more on the plastic arts. I mean, in the terms of things that were shaped and and were three-dimensional, um, is a little less emphasis on painting. I think that's where Lutherans begin to invest their money more in music, because that's really the pinnacle of Lutheran church music in that period. And then in the 19th century, there's a rebalancing of that, but also because they needed new churches by then. The practical is almost always the easiest answer in questions like that. I mean, it may, it may seem to be about principle or abstract ideas, but there's always something underneath it that's about, well, that didn't work anymore. We had to get a new one. Way in the back. This is related, but perhaps a bit off topic. Would you talk a bit about the Nazi collecting paintings and artworks? What was their purpose? Did they, in fact, save art that might have been destroyed? You know, what was that a practical? Is that a practical way to look at it? That in some ways they did save some things. But would you talk about what their what their purpose was? What they hoped to get out of it? Was it economic? Well, I, let me say that the shorthand, my shorthand answer to the questions of why the Nazis looted art is that they were horrible barbarians who wanted to show off their power by taking what legitimately belonged to other people and being able to show that they possessed it now. Um, I think that's at the heart of it. There might have been one or another of the high ranking Nazis who had a tiny bit of taste, but it's not clear to me that there was. Um, they really, stole things for their value in the sense that they knew they were valuable. They weren't interested in art for art's sake. They were interested in art for possessions sake and as a sign of power. Art has always been a sign of power. Uh, Napoleon took the horses off St. Mark's in Venice and took them to Paris and eventually they found their way back. They in turn of course were taken from Constantinople by crusaders. So Art has always been something that has represented, we are stronger than you. 
and we've taken your art and made it our own. And, uh, and so I think a lot, that was the biggest thing at play. Um, of course, places like the Louvre in Paris, where they were able to take things, the, the museums in Russia, but it worked the other way too. The Russians took a lot after, at the end of the Second World War that ended up in the Hermitage that had been in museums in Berlin. So it, it kind of, it goes around. Apart from the specific um, uh, appropriation of the wealth of Jewish families in Germany, which is a crime unto itself, a slightly different thing, that was often done to make money because they didn't keep the art in many cases. They sold it, put it on the market, and then it was ready money for the purposes of, uh, of Hitler's henchmen. But the... Um, but the conquest of art from other countries, the taking of things from museums and countries that have been conquered, that always has a political purpose. And, it's, and it doesn't work if you don't display it. You have to take it home and show it that you have it. And, uh, and so there were, they did that kind of thing. It's like trophies of war, in a sense. But there's much more to it than that. That's just the kind of my superficial reaction. Just a quick, anybody on Zoom that might have a question, you can use your raise the hand feature and we'll keep an eye out and um, turn to you if you should have a question on our Zoom. As you showed us paintings, you mentioned that all the characters are very Germanic in appearance. Was there any sensitivity at all to what people may have actually looked like um, where these stories occurred? Even in the sense of stories set in the ancient Near East in the Bible times, yeah, no, not at all. Um, uh, although it's interesting that there is a shift already happening in that Luther's way of reading the Bible is very clearly related to context. Um, he's not, he doesn't see these as abstract stories that are cut loose from their origin. I mean, he, he would, the thing is that they just didn't know much about that. There weren't, they couldn't look it up. And uh, so Luther's understanding of the past, even the church of the past, doesn't go back as far as the early church. It really only goes back kind of in the lore of the people out of whom he comes. So say 200 years. Um, and so they wouldn't have known. I mean, they might have, they, I think by making these people wear contemporary clothing, the kind of clothing people would wear in their own day, they were trying to make it more real. That was realistic. This was as realistic as they could get. They didn't really know, although Jesus always has this kind of simple robe thing, um, a kind of a tunic, and that sort of clothing was known too. So it's, it, yeah, it's a good question. Um, the clothing is not, it's certainly not, it's not until the 19th century that people actually begin to try to depict Bible stories as looking like they had happened two millennia before. And even then it's a guess. Now, the one thing about ethnic difference is that uh, 16th century Germany was not a very diverse place, uh, but it was diverse in tiny ways. The, the Holy Roman Emperor had an entourage, in his entourage a handful of, of South American natives who had been brought across the ocean with the gold and silver to be shown off at the court. So they were like curiosities. Um, like a menagerie. And, uh, and we know that medieval Europeans had, there were a few Africans who lived in Europe who were kind of celebrities in a way because they were unlike anyone else. And people were afraid of them. I mean, people would run away if they saw a black person because they didn't know what that meant. They might not be a human or something and they never, never would have seen one. But there are a couple of cases in medieval art of absolutely beautiful depictions of a saint who was historically known to be African beautiful features, clearly modeled on an actual African. I mean, many of them are just dark-skinned Europeans, but there are a couple um, that are really extraordinary. I wish I could easily show you, but, um, but clearly there were some artists who had experience of greater diversity than others. Kronoff never, as I can remember, never really paints anybody who isn't European, although some are darker complected than others. Mm -hmm. Did Cronach ever paint a nativity scene? Yes, there are there are nativities. Um, yeah, you know the, the how Cronach deals with different stories would be a good talk in itself. 
maybe at Christmas time. Yeah. We'll do that. <laughs> Series number two. Yeah, right, exactly. I'm really grateful to all of you for staying so long and being so engaged in this. This is fascinating to me. I wish I could show you the, the pictures in their own settings where they're so much more vivid and easier to see. But thanks for being here today. Thank you so very much, Dr. Irwin. I think that sounds like a great idea. A portraiture trip yes. led by President Irwin. Yes. <laughs> Anybody ready to sign up for that? <laughs> I would do that, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Thank you all so very much for being here today. Um, preaching perspectives tomorrow here from nine to four. Luther colloquy on Wednesday from nine to from eight thirty to five on Lutheran spirituality. Um, so you're welcome to come back for any of those events. Keep an eye on our website, United Lutheran Seminary Lifelong Learning Events. As they pop up, um, they go up on that site. As soon as we get them organized, they go up on that site. As always, if we can ever be of any help to you or you would like to have one of us come and be with your congregation, um, talk about United Lutheran Seminary, um, spread the great news of United Lutheran Seminary and the things that we're doing, we're happy to do that. Don't hesitate to be in touch. We're all on the website and easy to find. May God bless you. May God be with you. May God guide you. And may God remember to show you how to love as you go out into this very hard world. Many blessings on your travels and in your ministries and in your life. Amen. <laughs>